Hello friends, my name is JJ. So I know that a while ago I said that I wasn't going to do as many videos about politics going forward, but I also know that for a lot of you, I am one of your only sources of information about what is going on in the world of Canadian politics, and that is an obligation I take seriously. So in that sense, I feel like I would be doing a disservice to not at least occasionally provide you with a periodic Canadian politics update. You can think of this as my attempt to provide you with the bare minimum of information that you would need to fake your way through a conversation about Canadian current events circa May of 2021. All right, so let's begin with the big man, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Prime Minister Trudeau was narrowly re-elected to a second term in October of 2019, but in a symptom of that narrowness, he was also forced to confront, for the first time, a parliament in which his Liberal Party does not hold an outright majority of seats. Accordingly, for the last year and a half, he has been forced to work with at least one other party in order to get any of his legislation passed, either the NDP to his left or the Conservative Party to his right. Or even the French-Canadian Separatist Party, I suppose. This isn't the most desirable position for a Prime Minister to be in, but on the other hand, it's not exactly crazy Israeli-style coalition building either. Since the Liberal Party is generally regarded as a somewhat pragmatic centrist party, forming case-by-case -case partners for the purpose of passing individual bills isn't something widely outside of Trudeau's comfort zone. I certainly don't think there's any real sense that Canada has become significantly more ungovernable or unstable because of Trudeau's lost majority. A more significant setback for the Prime Minister has been the fact that the opposition parties can now gang up and force embarrassing investigations into the doings of the Trudeau administration, which they have. Last summer, there was this big scandal in which Trudeau was alleged to have rigged government contracts to give money to this charity where members of his famous family had worked over the years. Parliament is still investigating that one to this day. More recently, there have been a lot of scandalous revelations about chronic sexual harassment within the Canadian Armed Forces, including specific allegations against Canada's top soldier. And in response, the opposition parties have been eager to make this into another who in the government knew what when type of thing with lots of committee hearings and whatnot. So on the one hand, this is bad for Trudeau because at this point, his administration has quite a few scandals to its name. On the other hand, a lot of Trudeau supporters would say that many of these scandals have been quite overhyped and are not actually resonating that much with the public. As proof, they can point to the fact that the prime minister's approval rating is actually the highest it's been in years, certainly much higher than it was when he was reelected in 2019. Though that in turn may be most readily explained by the other big thing dominating Canadian politics at the moment, COVID. Trudeau's numbers made an almost overnight leap once the pandemic broke last year in what a lot of people have interpreted as a rally around the leader phenomenon as Canada entered one of the worst crises in its modern history. Trudeau, with his new beard, was very much the public face of government communication for many months, constantly going on television to calmly explain the new rules and restrictions as they were being imposed. And it does seem like this sort of thing played well to his skills as a empathetic communicator. His popularity was also no doubt boosted by an early sense that Canada was handling the pandemic really well. Certainly much better than America, which is really the only international comparison that Canadians care much about for anything. In the first few months of the pandemic, Canada was recording very low rates of new cases while America's were skyrocketing. As the U.S. continues to set new single day records for cases, our neighbors to the north in Canada are experiencing a completely different situation. Canada started out much like the United States, but as the COVID curve climbed, Canada crushed it now seeing on average just a few hundred new positive cases a day. Given that this was happening during the Trump presidency, one would constantly see reports in the press in both Canada and the US that presented Trudeau's Canada as a kind of model of informed, rational COVID policy in contrast to the anything goes chaos of Trump's America. A lot of this, however, also got bound up in ridiculously sweeping generalizations about the supposed fundamental differences between Canadians and Americans that weren't really informed by much hard evidence, but did stroke the Canadian national ego. My favorite example is this very cringe July 2020 editorial from the Toronto Star, which is Canada's biggest newspaper. At core, our national DNA favors the collective during a crisis that has demanded collective action, mutual sacrifice, looking out for the other, rather than insistence on 
personal liberty and pursuit of happiness. Many of the characteristics frequently cited as negatives in comparing Canada to the US are smaller size, our humility, our greater trust in government, our commitment to community and social services, no sense of our own mythic exceptionalism, have become assets in this crisis. Now, the reason I bring this up is because things are very different in Canada now. As we can see from this chart from Oxford University's COVID tracker, Canada's new case count began climbing steadily during the fall and winter of 2020, and has climbed very sharply lately, just as American cases have been dropping. So now, for the first time, Canada actually has a higher per capita rate of new cases than the US, something that makes no sense if we assume that the only thing keeping our cases low in the first place was some sort of inherent Canadian disposition towards doing everything right. Now, I don't wanna to get too much into what is causing Canada's recent spikes because I'm not sure there is a single obvious answer, but I do think that this new reality has been breeding a lot of frustration and disgust among voters as of late. I mean, it's a bit of psychological whiplash to go from one extreme to the other, and as anti-COVID protocols have been tightening up at a time when many people expect them to be loosening. There have been a lot of big anti-lockdown protests across major Canadian cities as of late, including this absolutely bonkers one in Montreal. But luckily for the Prime Minister, a lot of that anger is also being directed towards Canada's provincial governments. As in America, a lot of COVID restrictions are developed at the local level, so if they don't seem to be working, most Canadians will be savvy enough to direct their rage at what they perceive to be the appropriate target. And certainly some of Canada's provincial leaders, especially Jason Kenney of Alberta and Doug Ford of Ontario, have seen their popularity decline a fair bit since the last summer. They're both conservatives, but their governments haven't behaved in a sort of stereotypically aloof right-wing sort of way. In fact, Ford in particular often brags about having the toughest COVID rules in all of North America. We have implemented the strictest measures in all of North America. But of course that just breeds blowback of a different sort. One specific thing that Trudeau has gotten a lot of bad press for amid all of this, however, is vaccine procurement, which is under national jurisdiction. The Trudeau administration, for whatever reason, just did not cut very good deals with the vaccine makers. And as a result, Canada is now lagging quite significantly behind other developed nations when it comes to how much of our population has been vaccinated due to our small stockpiles. As you can see from this chart from the New York Times, as I film this, only about 3% of Canadians have thus far been fully vaccinated, compared to 32% of Americans and 23% of Brits. And we are significantly behind most European countries too. But you know, President Biden has also pledged to do what he can to amp up the inflow of vaccines into Canada, which Trudeau seems into. So I was on the phone with for about half an hour today, and uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, we helped a little bit there. We're going to try to help some more. I had a good conversation with President Biden last week uh, on this and, and other topics. Uh, Canada is positioned to receive uh, close to 50 million uh, doses uh, of vaccine before the end of June. So it is entirely possible that this current moment of low vaccinations isn't actually gonna last for much longer, making the supposed scandalousness of the present moment just one more supposedly damning thing that won't actually stick to Canada's Teflon PM. But all that said, there does seem to also be a rather broad consensus among political observers in this country that Trudeau will not force another national election, which he has the power to do, until Canada's COVID situation is in a better shape. But when that day does finally come, we know who Trudeau's two challengers for the prime ministership will be. So let us take a moment and see what the other party bosses have been up to. Aaron O'Toole, the new conservative leader, has not exactly been setting the world on fire, although I'm sure he would say that's intentional. He has basically delivered on what he promised, which was to be a leader representing the broad mainstream of his party, rather than any more ideological faction of it. In a recent speech to the Canadian Conservative Party convention, he pledged to run in the next election on an uncontroversial platform of what were clearly heavily focus grouped ideas like stronger anti-corruption legislation and a national strategy on mental health. O'Toole has also recently taken to sharing a very passionately held belief of his, which is that conservatives cannot win unless they have a strong plan for dealing with climate change. And I will not allow 338 candidates to defend against the lie from the liberals that we are a party of climate change deniers. 
we will have a plan to address climate change. It will be comprehensive and it will be serious. As a result, O'Toole recently threw his weight behind the idea of imposing a carbon tax, excuse me, carbon levy on fuel sales although this is not terribly different from what has already been introduced under Trudeau. This in turn was seen as a real betrayal of the conservative base, given that if there is one thing that Canada's conservatives have been known for in recent years, it's been being the pro-oil party, as the National Post put it. Scrapping Trudeau's carbon tax is a core promise the Conservative Party has made to its supporters for years. O'Toole won the Conservative leadership race last year while repeatedly promising to get rid of it, even signing a pledge that he would never introduce a carbon tax of his own. So yes, a pretty big pivot that has generated a lot of anger, but also praise in some more progressive corners as a sign that the conservatives are finally getting serious about one of the big issues of our time. It's interesting because O'Toole is now the first openly pro-choice head of the conservatives and the first one to brand himself as someone who takes climate change super seriously. So his supporters would say he is running a pretty savvy campaign, carefully designed to diffuse the two issues that are often cited by independents to rationalize not voting conservative and thereby making the party that much more electable. But of course, there are never any easy answers in politics, and there are plenty of more populist Canadian conservatives who think that their party has already compromised enough of its core values. Thank you very much. Some people online are always worried about the rise of a new hard right party that could capitalize on voters disillusioned with O'Toole. But I think that a greater risk is just that a lot of conservatives wouldn't be inspired to vote at all. All right, and now let us talk about party number three, the NDP, led by good old Jagmeet Singh. Now, as we have talked about several times before, Singh is obviously one of the more superficially interesting characters in Canadian political history. Certainly the idea that a child of Indian immigrants, who is also a member of a small religious community most Canadians barely understand, could run for prime minister, is an inspiring tale of the Canadian dream and reflects well on Canadian democracy. But that said, despite how inspiring inspiring he may be on paper. These days, I think that there has been a relatively broad consensus that Singh has been a fairly underwhelming politician in practice. He is not particularly charismatic, he is not a great debater, and he just overall doesn't really carry himself as someone who has a particularly strong mastery of policies or ideas. It is actually more than a little surprising that he was even renominated by his party to face off against Trudeau a second time, given how poorly he performed in 2019. But he was, and quite overwhelmingly, in fact. And what's perhaps just as curious is the fact that the party continues to believe that they can win if they just double down on the strength of his personality. As the CBC recently reported in the run-up to the next election, the NDP is pursuing an aggressive digital strategy to reach Canadians between the ages of 18 to 40, a strategy that puts Singh's personality and personal brand ahead of granular policy debates. As a result, Singh is spending an awful lot of time on social media these days, constantly posting and streaming and participating in all of the hottest memes and viral trends and whatnot. Since Singh represents Canada's most left-leaning party, the goal is clearly to turn him into some sort of online progressive hero, akin to someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. In fact, he has even explicitly teamed up with her on occasion. Do you all have Murdoch media in Canada? Like Murdoch-owned media in Canada? No, I don't think so. Do we have Murdoch-owned media? Now, there's obviously a considerable appetite for left-wing celebrities on the internet these days. And certainly, if Singh could become seen as someone as cool as, I don't know, H-bomber guy, that would doubtless be seen as a big victory for his people. But at the same time, it is worth remembering that online left-wing world is still very much a minority youth subculture consisting of a lot of people that don't even vote all that much. I mean, Bernie Sanders certainly had a mighty army of online lefty fans, but that wasn't enough to get him to the White House. This is coming off as a little bit unduly harsh on Singh, but you have to remember that presumably the NDP is Canada's perennial third or fourth place party for a reason. Continuously bad political strategy has to account for at least some of that. So yes, that is basically where the Canadian political situation stands today. Obviously there's a few other things happening on the edges as well, but this should at least be enough for you to nod knowingly the next time you see a Canadian tweeting about the news. I will see you next week for something aggressively apolitical.